All right, welcome to this video about classical India. That's Vedic culture, the Mauryan Empire, the Gupta Empire, and it's a lot. So let's get going. Um, some cautions about this. One, whoa, so much history. There's so much history here. And there's so many more texts and direct lines to current day culture, so many more artifacts. Um, there's so much to cover. So forgive me, because this will not be everything. And in fact, it might not even be things that I should be talking about. Uh, and also, this is a history of an area that was extensively colonized, particularly by the British Empire. And so the stories that have been told in English about Indian history tend to be that colonized history, the Westerners perspective on the history of these people, and not so much the stories that they themselves would tell or the ways in which they would shape uh, the story of their own history. So we have to be mindful of that. And you'll hear me talk about that in the presentation. Um, it's also a hugely, massively diverse area, and that means that I will be making really broad generalizations about this, which are useful for beginning to understand this place, but understand that there's so much hiding underneath the surface of every single thing I say. So um, there are all these practices, and we'll touch on very few of them, but um, there's the here's a, a priest performing a uh, purification ritual at home, and here's a dance from southern India. They're from entirely different regions, however, and you'll see more about that in a second. But just as a reminder about what we saw from last video about the Indus River Valley civilization, here's the Indus River, um, and here's Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, and they exist right up here in what is modern-day Pakistan, and the Khyber Pass is about to become very, very relevant, because that is where some new people come in with a different set of languages and settle down in through here. Uh, but we'll see that in just a minute. Now, you can see the evidence of some sort of shift over time in the languages spoken in these areas, most likely. We see that because there are these languages that are the uh, Indo-Aryan languages, the Hindi, the Gujarati, the Bengali, the um, Sindhi, the Punjabi, like all these different languages exist right here. And you see Dravidian languages down here in the bottom, but you also see it up here in Pakistan. And notice this map actually goes, fits like right here. Could not find a map of both of them in the same place. Anyway, uh, but clearly there, there's possibly, based on the evidence, that these Indo-European language speaking peoples moved in here and pushed the Dravidian folks south, but also left behind like a little pocket of those folks right here. That's one of the pieces of evidence we use to talk about this um, Indo-Aryan invasion of India, but that is a contested thing. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But let me give you an overview of the timeline we're talking about. From about 2000 BCE, that's when we first see horses show up in this area. We start seeing horse bones and things. And we think that's probably when this different language group uh, started to come in, first made their arrival. Um, and it's called the Vedic Age. This is named after the Vedas. It's a religious text, and it's our main source of information for the time period. Uh, this in general, is the first arrival of these Aryans. Uh, and we also see the first use of iron tools. And there's an expansion into that Ganges region of where that river is. And it's the origins of Hinduism are happening during this time period, but also Buddhism, uh, which is a reaction against that Vedic religion, uh, which later becomes Hinduism. Um, you can see some example of the pottery. I love this picture. Uh, the Mauryan Empire is also in the time period we're studying. Uh, it was founded by Chandragupta Maurya, who you can see a modern-day statue of over here. But his grandson, Ashoka, is probably the more famous of the rulers of, of that empire. Uh, it was one of the first examples of the political unification of most of India. And it spread Buddhism. It set up free hospitals, veterinary clinics, and good roads. Later, the Gupta Empire, in fact, if you look at this, it's 500 years later. Just take a second to wrap your head around why that's true, because you count down from here, and then start counting up from zero, and then get to there. About 500 years later, that's the golden age of classical Indian culture. Uh, and you see contributions like the idea of zero, and that's an incredibly useful thing, uh, how to set bones after you break them, the idea of a round earth being fully fleshed out as a, as a theory, and also some new textiles and literature pop up during this period. Here's a comparison of those two empires just so you have a sense of how expansive they were. The Mauryan Empire was huge. It got very, very large. We have some pretty clear evidence of where it was. Uh, but they never reached all the way to the south here where those Dravidian languages are spoken. Um, and both empires collapsed over time as a result of uh, pressure from outside of folks trying to invade, most likely through these 
these pass areas. Uh, and the Gupta Empire was smaller and only really controlled its core regions. It didn't have as much political control over all of the kings and rulers in these like outlying regions, which we'll talk more about later. Let's talk about the social patterns. And this is going to take up most of the video because the social patterns are fascinating and change over time and are really, really interesting historically. So the Indus Valley civilization collapsed and it then you didn't have that central authority of whatever kind it was that directed the irrigation and the creation of material goods and things like that. And so the most common way of living in the area became herding cattle for food and not the farming that had been present earlier. And those societies were different than the ones that had been there before, according to our evidence. They were, for example, patriarchal, where the men and particularly fathers and families and, and male rulers dominated that society. And here's a quote from the textbook that I've been using for, for writing these. I really like it. Members of the warrior class, which was big in that society, boasted of their martial skill, their fighting skill, and courage and relished combat, celebrated with lavish feasts and heavy drinking, and filled their leisure time with chariot racing and gambling. Because, again, these peoples, they brought the horse with them when they arrived. And you can see here a British depiction of what life might have been like, again, the British are proponents of this theory. They support this theory, but uh, native Indian historians, by and large, oppose that reading of history where these uh, Aryan migrations are the explanation for everything. Uh, and one of the challenges of that is that we don't have any written language from the time period. So all these texts that we're talking about, the Vedas, the Upanishads, um, they're from the oral tradition that existed back then, passing things down um, from person to person. So I'm going to put the writing and stuff they left behind in the middle here, in the middle of the social section, because it's so relevant. Um, so here you can see an example of passing uh, this knowledge down orally. This is modern day, clearly, but um, chanting and other ways of memorizing that information were used. And later they wrote things down. And scholars have argued ever since about, well, what was original and how did it change over time? And how did this change during the Mauryan Empire and all of that? Um, so we have from 1500 BCE, that's when they start being uh, created. Those are the Vedas. Um, and here's an example of a piece of text from the Vedas. Um, it's a, a set of ideas about how the world works or should work. And so it says, when they, meaning the creator God, divided the man into how many parts did they divide him? What were his parts called? The mouth, the Brahmin, spiritual leaders, the arms, the Shastriyas, the warriors, the thighs, the Vesha, the workers, and his feet, the Shudra, the servants or slaves. So see, it's trying to describe the different kinds of people. And so we have a sense of how their society was organized based on that. But we don't know perfectly what that means. Uh, and so we have to look to other texts to see what did that, how did that play out in, in everyday life. From about 800 BCE, the Upanishads, they were a collection of dialogues about the nature of the universe far more... Uh, closely related to later religious ideas like Buddhism. And it's interesting because these are, these they have the female learners as part of these dialogues. And later we have the this, this document, which codified an elaborate set of rules for how the Varnas could relate to one another. These up here are called the Varnas, these different groups of people. And you can see it also had rules against women and lower class people reading the Vedas. So in this time period where these laws are getting written down, it's also setting down more permanently these uh, discriminatory social practices, which again, um, doesn't necessarily mean that the original culture had those features. So let's talk more about what I just brought up though. So there's this rigid class system possibly including elements of slavery or something similar um, that was developed with the arrival of these Indo-European language speaking peoples, the Aryans. And today people most often use the word caste to describe that, caste. But this caste system did not fully emerge in the way that we see it today until much later in Indian history. When I say today, I, I also mean in the time period since Europeans have been studying it. Um, but it has its roots in the Varnas and the Jati. So the Varnas, Varnas were these different ways of looking at what people could be good at. So like their innate skills or abilities. Um, and you could be more spiritual, you could 
uh, be a person good at leading others. You could be a person who's good at doing complex work, like tilling the fields or selling things. Or you could be a person who's, you know, best suited to serve others. Or you could be left out entirely. Those are the, the folks down here at the bottom. Um, and over time, as more and more occupations developed, you had a set of further divisions called the jatis. And those are more about what you do for a job. And those were very controlled through birth. So you would be born into one of those. And over the centuries, these kind of merged together, both within India and especially as Europeans, caste, for example, is a Portuguese word. Um, as Europeans observed this, it kind of merged into being like all part of one big system. However, uh, caste and a lot of Western understanding of caste is based on European beliefs about India and not so much on the Indian beliefs themselves. But it's worth understanding what these sort of common misconceptions are so we can talk more deeply about how this system has actually worked over time and what it looks like today. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about Hinduism first. Uh, Hinduism has deeply influenced Indian society and is really deeply connected to Indian culture and is practiced around the world. Uh, you can see where it spread down here to became, uh, become the dominant religion in some of these areas, but also folks practice it in the United States. Um, there is a fascinating historical argument about whether you know polytheistic or monotheistic, because there's a belief in many forms of one God. Does that make that polytheistic or monotheistic? In the Christian religion, often uh, there's this idea that um, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and uh, God, they're all like part of one single deity uh, called the Trinity, which we'll talk more about in a future unit. But um, does that mean that Christianity is polytheistic or does it mean it's monotheistic? Or in fact, are those divisions artificial anyway? And are they even useful to us in describing the differences between religions? It's a very useful and fascinating debate. Um, but there are some key ideas within Hinduism. There's the idea of reincarnation, which is rebirth over time, uh, that life is this cycle and that you are brought back. The you-ness that makes you up is brought back in different forms over time. And that which forms you end up partaking in is a result of karma, the knowledge that all your actions will result in these future consequences. And there's so there are right actions and, and not so right actions. Um, the, the Vedas and Upanishads are their sacred writings. And you can see what it did was it spread along these major trade routes. Um, but in the same place comes another really important, powerful uh, world religion called Buddhism. Um, and Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, who's later called Buddha. And this took place in a place and a time where there were lots of people exploring lots of different religious ideas. Um, the founder here was originally a prince who was locked up in his palace by his parents and not allowed to see the suffering of the world. He goes out and sees the suffering of the world and decides, that's terrible. I need to understand this and how we can transcend this problem. And so he becomes uh, this seeker of religious knowledge and tries like starving himself. He tries uh, living in utter poverty and all these different ways of trying to achieve enlightenment, but arrives at the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to Enlightenment uh, which we will talk more about in a different video because this is already running very long. But know that Buddhism was very different than Hinduism, but drew on some of the same core beliefs from those early days, but it was non-hierarchical originally, meaning it didn't have that social structure. And so it was accepted and actually spread pretty widely because there are folks that found that very appealing. Um, it was also spread by Ashoka who converted and then sent missionaries out throughout Asia. And it became honestly, more common in other places than it is in India today. But let's talk about some of the political patterns that were a result of all of these social things. Um, the Brahmins had power. Those were the priestly class. The religious leaders had power through control of rituals and religious knowledge. Um, political unity, where like an emperor or a king would rule all of India, was very, very rare, in part due to the diversity of this place and also that folks had more of an allegiance to their class and their place within the social structure than they did to any given king. Um, under the Mauryan Empire, though, one of those examples of unity, um, they set up taxes that took one-fourth of all of the harvest and used that to pay an army and also to enact control over the mines and shipbuilding and weapons manufacturing and to keep all the other little rulers in line and also set up standardized coinage, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, and 
Ashoka, who was Chandragupta's grandson, expanded the, the borders immensely and then set up all these pillars uh, with proclamations and rules on them. You might think that's kind of similar to Hammurabi's code. You would be right. Uh, but at one point during his rulership, he conquered an area called Kalinga, modern-day Orissa, and he was so overwhelmed by the carnage and horror of that battle that he converted to Buddhism as a result. And that was the the motivating force behind him sending those missionaries everywhere. So later, 500 years later, the Gupta Empire, uh, founded by a guy who clearly wanted to sound very similar to the previous rulers, uh, they had very similar similar political features that I've talked about above, but they also demanded specific yearly labor from folks in the empire. They were less centralized. They didn't have direct control over the surrounding rulers and kings, but they at least sort of paid uh, homage to this ruler. And they made Hinduism the official religion again, and so Hinduism came to dominate the Indian subcontinent, where ruled by these folks. Now, under these empires you had technologies and new ways of doing things that resulted in three harvests, which is wild, including rice cultivation. And rice, you can get the most calories per acre of any kind of grain cultivation. So they had these massive harvests, and one-fourth of that turned out to be very good for supporting an empire. Uh, you also had an enormous amount of trade going on. You can see the map down here of these red trade routes. And the Indian trade went along both land and sea routes, but the sea routes are really cool because during one part of the year, the winds will blow you one direction really easily on a boat, and then during another part, they will blow you right back. So within a year, you can like head around here and do easy trade, which is fascinating. Also, all the infrastructure that was built during those empires, particularly the Mauryan Empire, sustained economic growth over time. And the that allowed these guilds, which are uh, groups of people who do the same thing or trade the same thing, who come together to make rules and kind of try and control that trade. Um, they became very powerful using all of that infrastructure, especially when the kings and emperors were weak. And this vast trade network, uh, India produced things like cotton, uh, like ivory. They also had uh, metalwork, which they were very experienced in, and also exotic animals to trade. And they also got silk and spices, silk from China, and then the spices from these islands down here. And they passed them on and made a lot of money in the organization of those things. So that's our video on classical India. I hope it was good.